Deidre Patrick, how the hell are you? I'm awesome. How are you? <laughs> I am great. My my very, very, very first memory of you is I was probably a sophomore at Arvin High, and they said that we were going to have uh, an assembly and a band of alumni was going to play for us. And you were in a band, and I want to say Robert Velasco was in the band. Yeah, Robert and, Velasco. And... I was learning how to, I was in beginning band at the time, learning how to play saxophone and Robert Velasco and you blew my mind. And I was just like, cause I'm just this little kid in, from Lamont and watching you guys play. Uh, were you guys doing covers at the time of like yeah. 80s hits? All 80s top 40. Back then, you know, you had to play exactly what came out on the billboard charts. Like that was your job to learn what was on the top 40. So that's what we were playing. But, you know, before we forget, it had Bobby Carmona on drums, uh, Robert Velasco on sax and keyboards, um, Joey De Los Santos on bass, uh, David Best on guitar. So all of them were from Arvin High except for David Best. That, that really is cool. so rad. And, you know, and from that moment on, like, I ultimately, like, uh, I struck up a friendship with Robert Velasco uh, maybe 10 or maybe 10 years later when I worked at the warehouse, the record store. Oh, yeah. And he would come in there. And um, and then eventually, through the Arvin High alumni band, one night I got to be in a sax section with Robert Velasco like it was like the ultimate sax section ever it was like charlie wren robert velasco me chris richards and it was like a dream come true to be sitting next to robert velasco and playing saxophone uh he's so but nice. he teaches out at arm high now yeah he's 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 the best guy but i still i also remember like oh my god look at that girl she's such a rock star <laughs> i remember mr mack was so mad at me because i was singing rock um, he didn't talk to me the whole day, you know what I mean? And he was like, we were really close. And I was like, what? He's like, you're singing rock. I'm like, not opera! What? <laughs> <laughs> so were you, were you a soprano or an alto? Alto, uh, always. Well, you're an alto with Mr. Mack. And were you in choir all four years at Arvin High? Yeah, all four years. Man. Like an alto, or alto, actually. That, uh, so he taught me a lot. Oh, Matthew heard me singing, so here he comes. He says, yes. You know, my son is, is deaf, so it's like Abbott and Costello all the time. I was singing. Oh. <laughs> I'm on the podcast. Why, you want to say hi? Is he going to say hi? Come say hi. Matthew, I feel like I know you. I've seen you Can grow you see up. Face? Yeah, I have seen him grow up over the years, and he is turning into a fine young man, an outstanding young man. And I'm. He's the one who has your, uh, your artwork. Oh. Cool, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for sending that, Matthew. I really appreciate it. So, like, you you never left the music scene, right? You just stayed yeah. and. I had a break um, in 1994 because I was touring with a band called Lickety Split, and we were on a year-long tour of the United States, and we were in a car accident. So, that accident was pretty bad. I was hurt really bad, and so I had about 10 years off. Oh wow! So I had three years in you know recovering from the injuries three years um which were really severe injuries and then i was afraid to go back on the road after that and i didn't know if i could sing again or walk again it was you know and so when i got better i had to start learning to sing again because i had broke nine ribs and punctured my lungs and so i couldn't really sing anymore yeah, so that happened, and so I had to come back here after I spent about uh, almost a month in the hospital where we were wrecked, which was in uh, right at the corner of Mapleton, Oregon, and Flo somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And so we ended up in Florence, Oregon, there in a hospital for, I did, for about three weeks, and then back here, you know, for about three years under medical care, and then... Um, I just started going to those jams out at the Branding Iron and Tamara from Lawn Faith kept encouraging me to get up and sing again. And um, everybody commented that I sing like a meadow singer, because <laughs> I did. And so I had to kind of calm down a little. 
Um, but then I just have never stopped since. So that was the only break I had. So from the time, you know, from I was time I was 17 until 29 and then again, back up again, you know, um, later. So yeah, I've never stopped. I've always been in the industry. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. And now, um, when I, when I first became friends with you on Facebook, I noticed that you did vocal lessons right. and so how long did, when did you start doing that? Um, when my son was born, he was born with cerebral palsy. And so I wasn't able to go back on the road and I decided to, uh, you know, what was I going to do for a living? Right. And so I started giving singing lessons. Um, that was in 19 or in 2001. I had given them before, but then I started giving them seriously. So I would take like one or two students while my son was a baby. And I did that uh, for a few years and then just started getting more and more students. And then I started working with Kern Regional Center as a music therapist, little voice lessons, music therapy for people with disabilities. And I've been doing that for a long time. I'd have to think when I started that. And so, um, I do it full time. So I do my singing lessons full time and I do gigs around my singing lessons. And now wow. I do art <laughs> since we haven't been able to have, I haven't been able to have a student in here, you know, since March. So, so you were doing singing lessons full time and it was going, it was going really well. Like are you having oh, yeah. like some success with some of those students like went on and I, like, right. I have a lot of students that are more my more successful students are metal singers and metal bands. Um, but then I have a, a lot of students who've gone on, um, even who've gone on to college to do music teachers and therapists and um, who are on tour. I have students that are in um, the Silent Planet, Nyseria, um, a lot of metal bands that have millions of hits on YouTube. They're really, really good singers. And also um, Dane from um, The Secret Five, I think was what their band was called. But that was a metal band he was in. So. Yeah. <laughs> what I do is I teach opera to metal singers. So to me, if you're going to sing metal or hard rock, it's the hardest genre really to pull off and do it live. I mean, for people, I teach people as if they're going to go on tour and be famous or famous is such a silly thing to say because it really doesn't matter. But if they're going to go on tour and have a career at it, I teach all my students that level, regardless of what their goals are. Everybody gets the same training. And so what it's geared for is especially someone who's on the road doing rock. Can you imagine how they throw their voice out? You always wonder how people that sing that kind of music, how can they do it night after night after night? Right. It's because you have to have a lot of training like operatic training and you train the shape of your throat, the shape of your voice to lift up into an operatic position through scales and different operatic techniques. And then just like any other muscle in your body, that muscle starts to stay in that position. So then you can belt out higher chest notes because the cavity of your face and your vocal cords and your larynx and everything is shaped as if it's an opera singer, which is the optimal training, but you belt it out straight, less vibrato um, in a chest register. So that's where you're able to do that. And so that's kind of what I specialize in. But now, you know, I teach all genres because basically it all comes from a classical operatic platform. Wow, that just blew my mind right now. I had no idea that all, of, I mean, I know it's hard work, right? Like I know any type of singing professional is hard work, but that I had never put the operatic training to the metal growl, uh, right. so to say. So how soon into it did you start to realize that you kind of have a niche for the metal uh, range or was it as a singer yeah like um, uh, like as far as like like voice training that that you kind of understood that well it's because that's the kind of band i was in uh -huh. as an original band in los angeles so that's the music i wrote and that's the music i sang after i left um from 19 like 83 to 89 i played here in bakersfield in a band called um contraband and that we, band yeah we played around everywhere you know we were young so usually if you called suds you know johnny madrid would just say that the kids are playing tonight and no offense but we weren't that good <laughs> no offense to everybody in the band but hello like i remember that gig at arvin high by just saying there was one song where one half of the band was playing like a virgin and the other half of the band was playing into the groove okay so i'm sitting here going hmm Get into the group like a virgin. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I mean, 
oh my god and we weren't supposed to play like a virgin because it was at the high school so i was like that is so crazy you know what and there was another time we played a song um our house in the middle of the street and we were at um chateau basque and i couldn't remember the melody so i was just singing any old thing in my head it didn't go to the song at all <laughs> i was just like making it up we were i was 17 so <laughs> we were like you know just making stuff up and i can think of all kinds of crazy things that used to happen on stage and i tell my students that all the time because back then um you know you just went out and did it that's how you learned you just went out and you did it and if you sucked you sucked and you got better and you got better <laughs> but in answer to your question about metal in that time period it was a top 40 band you had to play every single thing off back in the 80s you know it was there were people that would line up all the way around the tam shanner to get in when we were playing and not just us you know there was our band there was glinda robles and the press and there was um street legal there were a lot of bands at that time playing i, really I, know remember, each other. I remember a, a band called automatic slim oh yeah and that had brett beller and uh is that the one that had randy horn we all know each other from back then, but we didn't like hang out and talk like we do now because there wasn't social media and you had contracts for gigs. So like we had two years at Tama Shanner, I mean, long contracts, one band. Really? And it was only like five bands <laughs> on the, on those kind of gigs and uh -huh. we held those gigs for about five years. And so, but it was no creativity. You couldn't write your songs. There was nowhere to play original music in Bakersfield. There was no downtown scene like that you had to do cover tunes. And so that's what we did. And I wanted to get out of here so that I could do something different because it just wasn't available here. So I moved to LA and I wanted to sing harder music. So I auditioned for a metal band called Tipsy Fox. And I got the part, <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't know anybody there. I literally circled roommates wanted and moved to LA. And so I saw in Musicians Connection, it's a magazine, that there was this band Tipsy Fox looking for a singer. And so I drove out to the valley because I lived in LA downtown kind of. And so I drove down to the valley and I auditioned and I didn't know anyone. So I would go there every night for two weeks and just sit there and watch all the other girls audition. And that was very enlightening. <laughs> and that's when I realized I could sing. Honestly, I didn't have, I, in my heart, I knew I could sing and I thought I could sing better than what I had ever displayed, but I was real shy. And so when I would go there and I was watching all these other girls, I noticed that I was kind of better. My timing was better. I knew things they didn't know. I knew theory. I knew um, how to read music. I knew things these people didn't know. And a lot of them showed up in like, you know, fishnet stockings with no underwear. <laughs> a lot of it was that, you know, and that also shocked me. I was like, oh, okay, wow, you know. And so it kind of gave me confidence that I actually could probably do it. And so I got that band and I played with them and then we broke up and into two other bands, but the whole time was metal. And so I couldn't really sing metal because I sounded like an opera singer. It was like, hit me with your best shot. If I was doing, oh my God, you know what I mean? If I was doing Pat Benatar, oh, and I would like, uh, whatever. I was really goody two shoes too. So I'd be like, well, that's how you're supposed to sing. And, <laughs> and then I moved to LA and started writing and found my own voice and realized I really never sounded any good until I started singing my own songs. I think until then I was always compared to everybody else and I didn't sound like anybody else. I didn't have a light pop, Cindy Lauper, Madonna. I didn't have that kind of voice. And that's what was really popular, you know? And so um, in the eighties, and I had a deep kind of heavy voice. And so when I started writing my own songs, it just was a whole new world for me. And I figured out how to sing in key. I couldn't even sing in key. I don't know why I was always off key. Uh, in front of people live, always off key. I always had problems with being on pitch, which I don't have any problems with at all anymore. It was confidence. When you're up there nervous, your muscles start fluctuating and it makes your pitch go up and down. If you don't learn how to calm your muscles down, your pitch is not going to stay straight. So I, it took me a long time to learn to figure that out. And so that's, uh, I, I could tell you all kinds of crazy things I did though to sound metal <laughs> that weren't proper, but you know, um, because I sounded so soft and there weren't any girl metal bands there in Hollywood at that time. 
Hi, my, who's there? Oh yeah, those my roommate came out. So yeah. that's that's Hollywood. That's that's what what era is that? Is that early nineties? Eighty. When I moved to LA was nineteen eighty nine, and I played there till nineteen ninety four, and then I went on the road. With that was band. a great time for yeah. metal in LA. Right, and we played. You know, we played the Strip. We played mostly in the Valley. We played a lot in our own space. We had a studio on Orion Boulevard, which was a warehouse section where there were a lot of bands at that time, metal bands. And we had big, a big warehouse that we had built out to be a stage and stuff. And so we threw parties and charged at either end of the warehouse entrance for people to come in rather than the pay to play, which you would pay about a thousand bucks, which you would have to buy a hundred tickets at $10 a piece. Uh, in order to play the Roxy or places like that. And yeah. if you sold your tickets, great. You know, then it's really not pay to play. You sell your tickets, you make your money. If you don't sell your tickets, then you're paying the bar to play there. And it's a good thing to do, you know, and you want to do it a couple of times, but that's expensive when you're, you know, a musician trying to make it and do an original music. Cause you know, um, original music, you've got to have a bar that, that, in LA, there's a lot of bars. There were then for original music. That was not even an issue. Like here, there wasn't. Um, but anyway, so now that's why I love the scene here. And in a lot of places, because of YouTube and social media, being unique, being different, being okay with who you are, what your style is, putting it out there. If you're different, you can go on YouTube and find someone and go, oh, I'm not that weird. That person sounds like me. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if you get what I mean, but when you were younger as a musician and there wasn't anyone to compare yourself to, you know, and to, if you had a weird voice or a unique voice like mine, it was, it was hard to kind of find that confidence where you kind of fit in in a way, like some kind of person to sort of emulate in a way. Well, you know, but, you know, you know, one thing that I've heard uh, musicians say about the YouTube era, and maybe this is going to make sense to you, is that before YouTube, it was a lot easier for someone to be original. So like, that's how you say that, that because, because now everybody goes to YouTube to learn how to do something. But before you didn't have that to learn how to do something. So you were learning on your own. So that's you how you develop. That's how you developed an original sound. But now everybody kind of sounds the same because they're learning from like the same batch of YouTube videos. But that's like, true. That is true. I see it with my students a lot. I really, really push with them how to learn technique and use the technique to find their unique style. In other words, if you're singing with just technique, how to sing your notes right, how to control your vibrato, how to, how to do that, your own natural body and style is going to come out by your influences and things like that. If you go on YouTube and you try to emulate someone else, you're going to start moving your lips and your tongue in ways to try to make your voice sound like them which therefore makes your lips and your tongue moving incorrectly. It's like playing the guitar and you keep bending your finger incorrectly so you can't lay it down on that chord. It's the same thing your lips and your tongue do for your voice. So I always, and when people talk to me about things like you are right now, I always tend to go to like, I think in such technical terms of yes, well, technically this is why, you know, that happens. And that's why people do that. Even people, let's say that are voiceover artists that have to use their lips and their tongue and their throat to make their voice sound different ways, you know, when they're acting or when they're doing that, that can be kind of damaging too. So if they take voice lessons in order to keep the, that instrument warmed up and so forth. You know, talking about originality, I think you're right. I mean, when I was writing songs, there wasn't, like I was saying, anyone to compare to, which did make me a little insecure, though, because I do have a, um, a different sounding voice, you know, and back then I didn't know that that was okay to sound like a guy when I sing or whatever, I have a deep voice, and I was a little insecure about it. Um, but at the same time, you know, there isn't, there wasn't anyone to influence style or, or anything, and now, even when I... When I write now, I really refuse to listen to stuff. Like when I work with the producer and he sends me stuff, like even working with Jose Feliciano and the producer would send me stuff and he would just say, um, hey, I, you know, I think a gospel sound might sound okay on this. Uh, one song I did was The Itch and I guess it's a cover tune. I've never even heard the original. I didn't want to hear the original when I did it for Jose because I didn't want to be influenced by what someone else had already done. So I don't know if that's old school of not of being used to not going there. <laughs> I, I've heard a lot of artists say that, that whenever they're in their process, they don't want to listen to anything uh -uh. for exactly the same reason that you've said is that right. they don't want anything to influence what, 
what they're okay. writing. I think being a true artist is knowing that you have a weird brain and that what's up in there is okay. And that if you didn't have strange thoughts or unique thoughts and thoughts that you realized were different from everybody else's, well, then you wouldn't be an artist. And so if you stop sharing those strange thoughts or those ideas, or you let someone else influence them, then that really takes away from really what it means to be born like a true artist. You know what I mean? I hear you. So that's, I, how yeah. did you, that's so, how did you end up working with for Jose Feliciano? What, what's that project like? Can you talk more about it or? Sure. It's finished. And so I can, it, um, it's interesting because now in today's day and age, you know, we don't have to be in the studio with the person. And the way that I got onto that project is my friend, um, Rich Gerard, who's also my producer for my two albums that I've recently put out. One was the Christmas album, uh, Peace for Christmas with Chris Neufeld, New Trick. And then recently I put out a Christian rock album um, with him that was maybe in 2018, I think it went out. Um, so he is Jose Feliciano's producer. He produced Feliz Navidad and he produced um, and won the Grammy with Jose on Light My Fire in 1967. And he and I have been friends since um, I lived in Los Angeles because I was really good friends with his son and his son introduced me to him and we kind of kept in contact when I was on tour. And then um, I pretty much just, he's what kept me interested in still going in the music whenever I was recovering from my car accident was Rick and just kind of working with him. Um, and so he, because he works with Jose, I've done things for him for Jose, artwork I've done and, you know, like album covers, little CD covers and so forth. And then we put out a song with Jose called um, Santa Likes to Go to Mexico. I want to get a drink of water. Go for it. And it's a song that uh, was written that Rick owns and um, Rick had put it, I mean, Jose had put it out with Rick at, with a choir um, several years back, but me and Chris, Chris and I, we listened to it and we reworked it. And then Jose came in and sang a verse and it's a cute, weird little video, <laughs> lyric video on YouTube. It's cute. We did that. And then um, Rick got the opportunity to do this album with uh, behind this guitar with Jose and um, with Anthem records. And then Rick uh, hired myself and Chris Neufeld and he hired me to do all the background vocals and the arranging of all the vocals um, on most of the songs. Chris did a couple of them. And uh, the way it worked was Rick would send me a song, like for instance, The Chain, and just say, you know, uh, I wanna do a remake of The Chain and I want it to sound uh, different. I said, well, how about, I told him, how about I do backgrounds like a witch standing in the middle of the bayou swamp in Louisiana, you know, and make it all weird like that. And so I just went in the studio and did all kinds of weird noises, like ah, weird stuff like that. And then some singing, and it's all through that record, The Chain. Um, other songs he would send and he would just uh, say, you know, maybe I want a gospel background. And I would do like, I'm America. I wrote and arranged this gospel background and me and Chris, and I think Rick's got some parts singing in there too, saying all this background on this song. Um, but the way it works is he would send this to us and Chris and I, Chris has a really nice setup in his garage in Rosedale. And Chris and I would go in his garage studio, um, which I shouldn't say garage studio, it just happens to be next to it, but it's a really nice studio. And we go in there and we lay down all the vocals and uh, Chris mastered the background vocal tracks there, uh, mixed them and sent them to Rick who did mixing on them and they finished from there. And they did parts of this stuff in North Carolina, some in Nashville and here in Bakersfield. So isn't that cool with the way it is? Jose is so nice though. He recorded a video for my son for graduation. Really? Yeah, That's so him, awesome. <laughs> isn't that cool? Telling yeah. him, you know, good luck with your future and, and so forth, you know, so that was really nice. But yeah, so that album's out and going and um, that's how that works. I, I, I had my own Jose Feliciano resurgence uh, last year when I went and cool. saw um, the, the new Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yep. Because they have Jose Feliciano's version of uh, California Dreaming. I was just going to say that. I mean, that is phenomenal. Phenomenal. I can't even, someone showed that to me and I hadn't heard it before and I hit play and I was like, oh my God. I mean, I love it. I think he's amazing. 
He's an yeah. amazing guitarist. He's a nice man. You know, um, hopefully his album does well. The Chain is doing really well. And um, it seems to be doing well. And it's just nice to see him do another album. And this yeah, is yeah. He's, 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 a, he's an icon. He, he definitely is. And, and uh, it's, it's great to hear that he's still doing stuff and being creative. You know, I think we were, Chris and I were both honored to be able to work on the project. I would hope someday we get to meet him in person because I mean, I've known him and talked with Rick about him and him to Jose about me for over 30 years. So to me, wow. I, feel like I know him. Yeah. But, you know, I've never met him in real life. It seems like you guys are due. I'm sure it'll happen one day. <laughs> I'm sure it'll happen one day. I hope so. So let's look, we're going to, we're going to segue now from, okay. because I think you and I could both talk about music like all day okay. long. Because I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I definitely could myself. Um, but so pandemic starts, you can't have students in your home anymore. You've got to be bummed out. What led you to pick up the, the, the colors and start painting again? Or were you always, kind of painting a little bit in the background yeah. what what t tell me what happened when the pandemic hit you couldn't have students in the home anymore and what made you decide to uh paint take the to take the colors to the canvas i um it, well yeah in march you know i was shut down completely because the students come in person here to my house and i'm already i already i'll just tell you this for the last 10 years make students sign a little thing when they join that if they're sick they can't come in i mean because of my son's con has cerebral palsy and I, I've done that anyway but when and I saw this coming ahead because I watched those kind of sick trends people make fun of me <laughs> all in jest but like okay I'm like okay there's something going around you know so I knew so anyway um, I was kind of sitting around from March till July just um, doing nothing you know painting little vases craft stuff for fun but then um, in July, July is a special month for me in a way. It's always a tough month because my first son passed away July 12th and my mother passed away July 9th. And so not of the same year. And, um, and my first son was just, you know, a result of, of the injuries from my car accident on tour. And so just being able to have a child from the car accident. And so my son died after he was born. And so that month's always kind of hard. So July came around this year and I thought, you know, I'm going to paint a picture for my mom and for my son. You know, I'm going to paint them a picture. And just for fun, I started painting on this canvas with this paint that wasn't real expensive paint. So I've learned so much since the first painting. But um, that just student level acrylic paint that I had bought for my son in a canvas. And I painted this painting. Here, I'll show you. Sure. Let me see. It's be right back. I'm in my painting clothes right now. <laughs> this one. Can you see it? Yes. So this painting I painted for my mom and my mom has a little pink ribbon for breast cancer here and my son with his hearing aid and me holding my baby when he passed away. Oh and I've seen that. Yeah. I've seen that on other of your paintings. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You have a bigger so painting than that. I painted that not thinking a thing, right? Like not thinking I could paint. And I put it on Facebook. It got about 300 likes. And I thought, wow. Okay. Now just the background, I, I did do art all through school and I got a scholarship for art for college. And I was um, honored nationally uh, for best senior artist in the nation. When I was a senior, they have this who's who of seniors and I was in there for best artist, but I went to college <laughs> and got in a rock band and just quit. And I never painted. I just did Conte crayon, charcoal, sketching. I didn't like color. I was afraid of color. And so I thought since I couldn't use color that I couldn't paint. Also the weird stuff I paint, uh, someone told me that no one would buy it. It wasn't commercial and I couldn't make a career at it. And so I needed to do something I could get a job with, which really discouraged me. And so I just never painted and never did anything ever again from that point until July of this year. So that's been over 30 years since I've even drawn a picture. I mean, I do scribble and stuff, but I had old journals. So some of the stuff I've painted is just from old pictures I had drawn way back when. Um, I thought it was weird that people liked my style too. Um, that, it just surprises me all of it about the art. 
And I haven't stopped painting since though. And I've sold five original paintings and a bunch of prints and cups, coffee cups. And I just pray to God that it keeps going. Cause honestly, I mean, I know, I feel blessed. I know the quarantine has been hard for people. For someone like me, it was a needed kind of rest. And had it not been for this downtime and being forced to not go anywhere or do anything, I never would have started painting. Um, I needed an outlet for my creativity, for writing. And I was kind of burnt out a little bit on singing, honestly. And so I was just like, but I never get burnt out as an artist like we were talking about earlier. My brain is going nonstop 24 seven with images, with lyrics. My brain never stops, you know what I mean? And so it has to have, I have to have like an outlet creatively. And so I just started painting and since people like it, I've just been kind of subsidizing my income a little bit with it and hoping that I can continue that. <laughs> that is so great that you've been able to one, subsidize your income with it because everything came to just a grinding halt for not only for you, but for so many people, right? But yeah, then that's my whole income is just voice lessons. It's not like, you know, I'm a divorcee with alimony or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just me and my business and the income I make with my business. And so um, I feel really blessed and I hope I knock on wood that it's not just some flute because I love it. I love it. I love painting. I love the control over it. It's different than music. Um, it's completely me. I, not to say I don't enjoy writing with people and playing with people, but this is all me. The, it's like I want to put lyrics, even though to other people that may seem weird, the images I paint or whatever, they're purposeful for me. It's an image I have in, a he in my head and a message I want to say, and I want to say it in a strange way. I don't want to paint it straight. I don't know how else to say it. I like it to look weird. I want it to be the image in my head. And so since I'm not writing lyrics, I'm trying to put them on canvas. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So there has to be that outlet. Most of my students that sing and most musicians I know are artists. So it just is something I think that goes together in a way with a lot of people. That's awesome. I think the, the painting behind you is such a great self-portrait. To, to <laughs> me, it really says like, like where, where you where you found yourself right when the pandemic started right like you couldn't that's it that's one of the first ones i painted and i had my son uh take a picture of me sitting at my piano and um then i put makeup on the thing but <laughs> i was sitting on the piano you know you don't want to see the real picture actually that's a real piece of art but um i had him take a bunch of photos so i could get the right light and then i painted it and um don giannatoni I hope I say that name right. I like saying it. Anyway, from Sister D, she owns that original painting. She bought it. She bought it before it was done painting. She's typed it. I'm buying that painting. I want it. I'm like, okay. That's right. <laughs> Deep Art Je Clay mu Museum print. As you can see, it looks like it's an original, like the paintings there, but they're, um, they're acid-free museum quality archival prints. So what that means is that if you ever show in a museum and you have a print, you have to have this particular type of paper that they're printed on they have to be paper that will last 200 years that's um really high quality print paper so i don't even print posters you know what i mean well you know you have two of them so they're that's what those are and that's why they're a little more expensive i've considered like just printing the cheapy posters i don't even want to i like having the high quality <laughs> papered posters that i know aren't gonna tear like matthews that you got kind of thin paper yeah it's you know, it's really but you can tell you can tell the quality ordered. what's yeah, you that can tell the difference right yeah yeah and i and i really admire that that you take that extra step and like really like i don't think that like i mean cost isn't really like when I'm looking at something, of course, there's like a, there's like a ceiling on what I'm going to pay for it. Right. But I know that, that I'm paying for quality, right? Like if yeah. you're paying $9 for something, well, I mean, you, like they always say, you get what you pay for, right? Like it's the truth. And for me, art is like, well, you know, I want it to last. I want it to be, um, a quality print. I want people, the reason they buy prints is they can't afford the original. So I want them to get a print that is like the original, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's important to me. Remember how particular I was about the colors and so forth on your posters. 
Uh, since then, you know, all I've done is engross myself since July, since I started painting in teaching myself everything I need to know about uh, what type of paint to use. I only use the most expensive paint, really not, only because it's the best paint. I mean, you have to, it lasts forever. It makes a difference. There's different quality of canvas you use for professional stuff. So I do all of it like that. But what I've really been studying is other artists who have YouTube channels and what they do. And they're even as particular as I am getting prints. But I finally learned that some print shops online will do a, a test print for you. I didn't know that. They'll oh, charge wow. you, but not as much. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing that. And so now I finally found, you know, like what I really like as far as the quality of the paper and everything like that. So that's really good. But there's so much to know, like starting my own web page. Um, starting my online store, how to do that, how to set up for shipping, um, an Etsy store. I Do you have an Etsy store? Do you sell stuff? Hey, no. where's my shirt? Oh, the, the, guy, the guy had an operation and it, everything's pushed back about 10 days, but yeah. I totally forgot I ordered one. No, 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 I have a, I have a list. I think it's right. It's still in less time than my art took. <laughs> I think it's still, it's only been about two weeks. Let's see. <laughs> There's my list of everyone's, everyone, the name, size. And, that's a lot. And, yeah, I sold 24 of them. Yeah, but that's good. That's so good that all those people ordered that. That's awesome. That's a yeah, cool and trick. I have, and I have, um, look at these, um, I bought these, hold on a second. Whoops. Did you design that shirt? No, a local, a local artist named Evan T. Lilly. Uh -huh. He's done all of our, uh, he did, he did this design for my friend's um, sketch group. Uh -huh. uh, he did the, the telenovela design for my improv team and I even bought, uh, I have a plastic, I have purple plastic shipping bags ready to go. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice shirt. I like it. Yeah. It's Matthew, he's going to love it. Well, I actually wear his clothes, so it doesn't matter, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm super excited about, about putting it out there, and especially with the whole life I love you, because that's kind of like my my thing of, like, always being grateful. So, yeah, no, those those hopefully will, I should be hearing something about them next week, and then. As soon as I get them, like like I said, I already have the the packages ready to go, and I will take them to the post office and ship them. I'm I'm so excited to get those out there. You um, know, something you just said about always being grateful. I don't know. I feel like I want to talk about that for a second. Do it. You know, as someone through most of my life who kind of suffered from depression, and you would read these books that would say, you know, just think positive thoughts, <laughs> or you know just just this just that or um you know even with god when it says you know we'll just let god let it be and let god even that you know it's like how do you do that right i have to physically teach my i mean mentally it, it's i i want to say that it becomes a really a mental effort but if you take that mental effort you can literally change the way your brain works all those silly memes that we see is that how you say it or is it meme -y? meme meme -y. i would say memes <laughs> meme all of those things you know and you see it oh think positive thoughts in your brain it's the truth though scientifically you know so what i would do i was just telling my son this the other day if you every day i look around and i i'm so grateful honestly i am very grateful because you know i've been where nowhere to live you know matthew and i've moved 14 times he's 19. you know um I look, I'm always so grateful and just waking up and making yourself think and look around and feel blessed. And, and if it, be, even if it feels robotic at first to say, I feel so blessed, I feel so grateful for what I have, even if inside you feel down and depressed and like, it doesn't feel real to even say that, you know what I mean? But you know, if you just tell yourself that I feel, I feel so blessed, look what I have, even if it's only one thing more than you didn't have last year when maybe you were down and out or whatever, that one thing more. And eventually you don't have to make yourself say it. It's really weird. You really train yourself. And what I did it with was negative thoughts of people that were being mean to me and they would come into my brain and I would picture them bouncing off my brain, like a little cartoon thing. And they'd go off into the sky. Whoa! I literally would picture them as an artist, like, bye-bye. And I would make myself 
say something very positive in my brain for five times each time. And it took a while and eventually I never thought about it anymore. I'm not depressed anymore. I've learned to just have happier thoughts. My brain has kind of rewired itself. I mean, not to sound like I'm strange, but it really does work. But I only say that because before I figured this out, I used to think it was just a prayer. I know that sounds silly, but just a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, please help me uh, not feel so depressed. Please. I never learned the action behind the prayer that I was supposed to take. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Like it's magic or whatever your belief is. Whatever your belief is, it's a belief, just a belief until you put action behind it. You know what I mean? And so you, even if it seems strange, but I don't know why I feel compelled to say that, but for someone's listening that's depressed or whatever, seriously, it works. You know, you just no. have to stick five things, say it on your finger five times each finger every day, you know? And eventually your brain rewires its science, you know, it rewires itself. But I, I always um, hear in my head, a friend of mine a long time ago told me, don't talk about it, be about it, you know, <laughs> and like how I like, like I, I try to keep positive, but I need to do positive actions and I, and I need to, I need to, I need to be the, the, the positivity, like. Like, I can't just say I'm going to be positive. I mean, that that's the life I have to live. And like, and it's the simplest things like just holding the door open for somebody or like, you know, um, saying hi to somebody or just like, you know, letting somebody merge in front of you on the freeway. Like, we're all going to get there, you know, but uh, it's just like, just like, kindness. like, yeah, like how you said, like, there's got to be an action. It's not just a prayer. I, I can't just say I, I got to try to be positive. Like, I, I, I have to be positive. I I have to lead that by example. And like, um, I wave and I say hi to all my neighbors and like, you know, and we just, we just got to, we have to be the change. You know, we can't, the truth. like, we can't That's just true. hope for change. Like, like we have to be the change. I think, you know, right. Yeah. I was talking to my son about that though the other night and I was just telling him that, well, from now on, when you hear negative thoughts in your head, cause he has autism. So he sometimes thinks it's actually people in his head. He doesn't understand that, we have thoughts in our head um, that sometimes are positive and sometimes are negative. He thinks it's like a person, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I had to explain to him how that's how humans are. And you have to learn to control your thoughts. And that's what it means when people say control your thoughts, you know, control your thoughts, try to control your thoughts. But anyway, I don't know. When you said grateful, I just, I don't know. I felt compelled to talk about that for a minute. <laughs> no, I think, I think like with so many things that we talk about, I think being grateful is something we need to talk about because mm -hmm. a lot of people like to talk about how angry they are, about how woke they are, about how oppressed they are. But like, uh, I think we need to talk about also about how grateful we are. Something I, I haven't started doing, but I, I read about it, uh, very recently is like every morning, uh, write down like five things you're thankful for. Uh -huh. And, and I, I, I haven't started doing that yet, but I, I think it's something that I'm going to try to start doing here uh, in the near future, because I, I try to take every morning as slow as possible and, and enjoy my cup of coffee and, and, you know, and just sit outside and, and really just like let the gratefulness wash over me, but maybe I need to, to uh, put, to, uh, take an account of like what those things are so that, I remember, or maybe I remembered to work on something in particular, you know? I think the act of writing it um, is also a discipline of training your brain, of just writing it down and even just saying it five times. Again, that scientific of rewiring your brain. Uh, even if you don't think it, just the action of writing it just does more than you think. Just the action of thinking it for five minutes or however long it is, and then you're off it, or maybe you don't even believe it. Just that action does more than what you know. You know, my son, he was born at 23 weeks gestation. So he weighed one pound, three ounces. Oh my he gosh. Was 12 inches long. And he stayed in the hospital seven months. And they told me from the day he was born, he was going to die. I was told he was going to die every day. Matthew was born early at 23 weeks gestation. So he stayed in the hospital about, um, seven months and he had heart surgery, hernia surgery. And I was told over and over he was going to not make it. They'd call me into meetings to make me sit down because they thought that I was delusional because <laughs> I would, I didn't believe him. And every time they'd say that, I'd be like, no, nah, you know, he's going to live. And they were like, huh, I don't even know how she isn't getting this. You know, this kid, he was born with one layer of skin. His eyes were still fused shut. 
He didn't have any genitals yet. His lungs were not formed. 23 weeks gestation, that's how far along. At that time, there were no babies in the world that had lived at 23 weeks gestation. Well, that's not true. There was 0.01% survival rate. And so they called me in and gave me a meeting and said, you don't see, this is 0.01% survival rate. And I was like, thank you. That's what I told you. They were like, what the hell is wrong? I, go, I told you someone has survived. Obviously a baby has lived or there wouldn't be that one right there. I go, that one right there is for Matthew. I remember saying that to them. And when we left the hospital, they all lined up as I carried them out. And they said, we don't know how he lived. We don't know what it was and i said it's the prayer so i had taped matthew 7 verse 7 on his incubator um and i taped that bible verse for him and put it on that incubator and i don't know my first son died and i knew matthew was not going to die i knew even when they all the things and how little he was and all the things he went through he had all his blood drained and new blood put in he has had so much and you just saw him yeah. <laughs> He can walk. He's amazing. He can talk. He's about 70% deaf, but he is a miracle. And so my point is there are miracles. I mean, that's a miracle. I'm telling you the people used to come from all over at UCLA and get around his incubator. I finally had them put a big shield around the incubator and because people were gawking at him all the time and it was bugging me. You know what I mean? I couldn't have my private time with him as a mom. I didn't want people staring at my son. And, um, you know, he's just, to me, being grateful is just looking at him and realizing that if that kid can live and through every doctor and not even any medical records, nothing, um, you know, the only reason Matthew's story is not everywhere is I wouldn't sign a release for them to do anything on him. It just freaked me out. I didn't want anyone even breathing on him. So I refused to let the hospital take pictures. I refused to let them study him. I just refused everything. I didn't want anybody around him other than the doctors that had to be around him and the nurses that needed to be around him. Right. You know? I wanted him to live. And so, you know, with this pandemic and people that don't know that about me and wonder why am I so paranoid and I don't want people in here yet, even though I miss my students and people say, well, you know, I haven't been around anyone. They probably haven't. Uh, but you can't sing with a mask on. And you'd have to have a mask on because that prevents the projection to me <laughs> of the, I, that is just common sense from when flu season, I would have people wear a mask. I'd wear a mask if their kids had was sick. And I know it works because look at my healthy kid who has a compromised immune system, who is a healthy and walking and I keep him healthy with these practices. And so um, I can't take the risk of, him getting sick because he would be one of those people that's in that category that would go to his lungs or something like that and so i have to be really careful with that and so unfortunately um that's how it is right now i'm looking at hopefully getting back to um in-person lessons at the beginning of next year i mean not even until then i want to get through this season see how it plays out and you know what I mean? <laughs> I absolutely know what you mean. I mean, <laughs> I'm just like, I just have to, I mean, yeah. what if you lose in a few months to losing a whole life? I don't think people get it unless they've really had a, a child die in their arms or they really felt that and understand what that is like, you know? And it's like, well, I'm not going to risk, you know, going and doing a gig or having somebody, I'm not going to risk it. Even if it, I seem paranoid to everybody else, it's okay. I don't mind what they think. I'm not going to risk it. I have to watch out for him. And, um, and that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> from, from, from what I can see, you are doing an amazing job. And it, it's, it, was, it was really a thrill to watch your paintings just take off and like, I remember seeing the first one and thinking to myself, I wonder, I wonder, I hope she's going to sell some of these because these are super cool. You know, I have another painting by another uh, Arvin High alumni. Um, Kim? Kim Brown. Yeah. 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 Oh, my God. Where did she graduate? 
What, what did she to say to tell you? She told me to tell you something. Hold on. She, Kim Brown graduated. I was, I think she was a senior when I was a sophomore. Oh. So she was maybe a couple years younger than you. I graduated in 89. So uh, I, I want to say. Yeah, so she was like 85 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. She was in I, class with my sister, I think. Okay. Let me I see. I know everyone's shocked. You all thought I was 30. <laughs> I, hold on. I want to say she told me to, to remind you of something. Oh, she said, ask Deidre to sing a bit of Berlin's The Metro. Oh. She, she kills it. She says she thinks it was mes Metro. It was. We sang, I don't know how that went. All I remember uh, is riding on the Metro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she said to sing Metro that she used to sing. God, did she say at Masquerade? Yeah, I love those songs. It was, now, see, I liked Berlin. Berlin was a... And, Berlin was a great band. You know, I also liked a band that was signed as, I liked that band Till Tuesday. Do you remember oh, that yeah. band? Yeah, dude, I, I, that, band. I, that was my era. Like, that yeah. was a, I was in the Columbia Record and Tape Club and I. Me and, too. <laughs> yeah, that, that was so fun. Wasn't that fun? I would, had so many those, um, albums. Those, those 12 <laughs> albums carried me through high school. I want to say that mine were like Billy Joel's Greatest Hits, Volume 1 and 2. Uh, Till Tuesday, uh, John Mellencamp, Scarecrow. Uh, I don't need the, yeah. The, great music. I mean, really great music. I loved it. I liked the music of the 90s too. I loved grunge bands. I mean, I loved, I loved like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam. I loved all those bands. But before that, I loved like, you know, like new wave music. I was a new waver, you know what I mean? I have my hair all shaved on the side. I didn't have a mohawk, but you know, it kind of looked like a mohawk anyway. Too long to stand up, but. Um. Yeah, yeah that, that was the great, that was the, the great era, especially cause like you're just a couple years older than me that like really like 1982, 83 is when like that synth pop new wave sound just exploded and really laid the foundation for everything that came in the 80s and then it was yeah. so experimental so intelligent so uh well produced you know i liked it i liked the dance music of the, i liked um i liked the i even liked uh i liked it even better i think i was really into like spandau ballet and like all those bands during that time and more than rock I don't know why when I switched over more to rock was just when I moved to LA. So what's what's next for you with the with the painting? Are you are you just doing commissions and and just uh, doing I your right? Yeah, I just finished one. Luckily, so far the commissions I've done have been to do my own style. Like no one has. Well, I was approached by one person to do a um, portrait of him and his wife. Hi, Roger Bailey. <laughs> But I said, uh, I didn't think I could do it at the time. You know, I'm real honest, you know what I mean? And I said, unless you, unless you want to look like it's 1970s, I said, psychedelic. <laughs> of course, you know, I've been doing a lot of portraits since then, but I was kind of like nervous about that. So luckily the things that I've been commissioned for are like fantasy surrealism, which is what I really like to do. And I just finished one. And um, then I just finished another painting that took about 50 hours. Here, I'll show you that. Yeah, let's see it. I don't know how much you can see of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Oh, there she is. <laughs> that took 50 hours. And, um, but I really wanted to, that's a message, you know, she's stuck in a jar, but, you know, she's still blooming on the outside of it. <laughs> um, now I have a commission that I have to finish for my friend Bev that I'm finishing this weekend. That's just a constellation on a picture that she liked um, that I had painted. And from there, I have a couple of them in my head. So I'm just, uh, what I'm gonna focus on right now is building up my Etsy store and putting all the product up on there. That is uh -huh. a pain in the butt. I mean, you have to take each JPEG image and change the size to at least 2000 width. So even if it's like a 16 by 20 or whatever, you've got to change it to uh, 2000 width. So you got to change the size of all your JPEGs to put them to your Etsy store. <laughs> they have to be a certain size. It was a, such a pain in the butt for me to figure it out. I have two whole products on there right now, maybe three. 
<laughs> and, um, you know, and then my computer crashed. So now what I'm going to do is spend this um, weekend and next week uploading the Etsy store and my online store, which is kind of uploaded. It has the, uh, sorry, I'm moving for a second. My online store has the cups and all that and the puzzles and all that on there. But then I'm going to do a Christmas sale. So I'll do like one of those little code things that you can enter in when you check out that gives you like 10 or 15% off, you know, so I'll do that. And so my focus, even though I want to keep painting, I need to stop for a minute and focus on the business side of it and get those things up on my Etsy store and my webpage kind of lined out. So that that's the thing about it. It's interesting because I want to paint, paint, paint. And then, you know, so many people wanted to buy stuff, which is so grateful you should just name the thing grateful <laughs> what was that what was that like when the, when people started saying hey can i buy that were, were you like I thought at first it was just people that liked me like you and you just being nice you know <laughs> it's like <laughs> oh he doesn't really he's just trying to be nice to me you know what i mean um i still tend to think that and uh, because most people that buy from me are people that know me let me think have i had any strangers buy something i've had a couple of strangers buy things you know mm -hmm but it's people I know. But you know, I told you earlier, I've been studying artists and so forth. And so many artists say that the way they started is they had a, uh, maybe they already had a following somewhere like a musician or something and, and yeah. people like them and they like their story. And so they like their art. Um, one lady said to me, maybe everybody's buying your stuff just because they like your singing. And I thought, I hope not. because <laughs> That would suck because I need other people to buy my stuff. But um, I don't know. It's weird. I just keep painting what I like and keep thinking I need to get better and better and better. I mean, I'm really one of those people. I was like that with my singing and with writing. I want to be like good. I want to be really, really good. I want you to look at my paintings and even if it's a weird subject, I want you to see that there's talent behind how it was painted. It's important to me that I have clean lines and that it looks professional and I like to also combine abstract with something in the painting that's very, very real, like like the eyeballs, really like realistic, but then everything else around it kind of um, very abstract looking. So it's kind of a contradiction. So I kind of like to do that. So um, anyway, I think I need to focus on the business for a little bit. Yeah, I I, I love in the in the painting that 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 I have that the two that I have like I could really tell that it's a musician like this came from the mind of a musician uh yeah. as well you know what i'm saying like yeah that's why like uh your painting is right next to kim's right above my record player and uh i think like i said it gives me so much joy to know that like two local artists like uh, uh there, there there is no art in my house that was purchased at target or kohl's it's a really nice community it I really mean, is I really have been I'm really happy with the artists and the people that I've been meeting and interacting with since I've started painting. I mean, really encouraging people. Um, and that's been really nice. A, di a few different groups on Facebook, you know, and really just watching people, other artists has been really nice. But, you know, the people, I think, as you were just saying that, I was thinking most people that know, um, that have bought the paintings, I think are musicians. <laughs> because they are, you know, mostly music stuff. If I go like this. And you look at this wall here. It's all kind of music stuff. There's your painting. There's mine there. right there, yeah. Up there. So those are the originals. Uh huh. And so, you know, I've been thinking of not selling the originals um, for a while because I'd like to actually have them all so that I can go do a, a show or an art fair or something and have some originals to show. Um, I mean, unless someone wants to buy one, but uh, so far, look, I just said that and I've actually sold five originals, but not those originals. <laughs> Maybe I should keep those originals. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. One of them was uh, a lady with big wings, you know, holding a baby. That was a commission I did for Kelly Turley. Remember Kelly Turley from high school? No. I, I recognize the Turley name, but... Her and her sister are so pretty. They look like Elizabeth Taylor. Anyway, I um, painted a painting for her, and it hangs in her office in Arizona. She's a doctor. She, her husband's a doctor and she's a PA. And so it's in their um, office there. It's a women's clinic. And so it's of a lady holding a baby with big angel wings behind it. So I like knowing that that's there and that it's kind of comforting for the people that are in there, you know? 
that does sound very comforting for a doctor's office, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I kept picturing where it was going to be, you know, and it's kind of different than my other stuff only because, you know, I mean, it's going to be, even though I don't know if she was disappointed because she said, do it in your own style. And I was thinking, that'd be weird. So <laughs> maybe I better like tone it down a minute. A <laughs> little bit, a little bit. Um, anyway. Well, Deidre, I thank you for giving me some of your time this afternoon. And it, it took it it took us forever to plan this. Uh, I think we've been talking about this for at Probably least six month. weeks. Yeah, at least, something like six well, weeks. Six but weeks, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was supposed I, to do it before Halloween, but you know, I had to dye my hair. Yeah, it looks yeah, great. It, it looks the, great. The light coming in. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great, and um, I'll post links to um, all of your. Uh, I don't have the Etsy link, but I'll, I'll get it from you. Uh, I do have. Oh, okay, the, I, I will wait the, on that until I fix up the store. But the web page is good. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I have the link, so don't worry about trying to uh, to say it. I always think it's funny when people like give their links, and I'm like, that's. I'll just post it. It'll be there. Uh, thanks for your time, Deidre, and good luck to everything. And, and tell Matthew I said hi. And, and like I said, it's it's been a pleasure watching Matthew grow up over the years. He Thank really you. is a cool kid. I really like him. <laughs> Thank you very much. When I, I have to say real quick, when I play at the fair, I'll be walking down, you know, the, the main way there with, with Matthew after I get off stage and people are always all, hey, Matthew, hey, Matthew. And I said to him, dude, you're famous. And he says, I know, mama. <laughs> <laughs> He's so funny. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. Uh, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed talking to you today. It was really a pleasure and really a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Same, same goes for you, Dita. Same goes for you. All right, Deidre. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> okay. okay. Bye. Bye.